Following the tragic, potentially preventable death of another young child in the United Kingdom, I'm continuing my discussion on the role that primary healthcare professionals can play to really end these tragic events in children particularly. Please do have a listen to my podcast episode number 50 on the inquest findings related to the sad death of a child. I've put a link to my seven-step plan in the text. And this is simply a way that general practices can start taking asthma seriously and to really put an end to asthma attacks, which are significant events which can lead to serious outcomes. In essence, a system should be in place to identify patients who've had an attack, to review their records to identify modifiable risk factors that can cause attacks, and to ensure that these are fixed so that the individual person and also the systems in the practice are put in place to prevent others from having attacks. Now the key issue is really that asthma attacks are preventable in the vast majority of cases and an asthma attack therefore means that either the treatment is not working or that not enough has been prescribed or collected by the patient or that there are problems related to the way that the medication is being taken. Now we've known about modifiable risk factors for asthma for many years, 60 years in some of these cases. And I'm referring to factors associated with asthma attacks that could be fixed to prevent future attacks. So the idea of my seven-step asthma plan is for all patients who've had an asthma attack to be reviewed, and one of the aims being to identify and fix any modifiable risk factors that could have caused the attacks. So far, in the last three podcasts, I've discussed excess short-acting reliever prescriptions, insufficient inhaled corticosteroids and, and inadequate inhaler technique, three of the important modifiable risk factors which cause asthma attacks. Now today, I'm focusing on a fourth potentially modifiable risk factor for asthma attacks, and this relates to comorbid conditions, that is, other medical conditions that exist as well as asthma in the individual person. Now, before I continue, if you do find these podcasts helpful, please do click on the follow button so you'll get a reminder whenever a new episode is published. One of the first things to ascertain when reviewing somebody after an asthma attack is to confirm whether the diagnosis has been confirmed clinically. This would include a medical history, with or without a family history suggestive of asthma, a history of personal or family history of atopy or allergy, atopy being where somebody's been sensitized to something they're allergic to, so you've produced antibodies which will fight that uh, substance when you come in contact in the future. In addition, um, has there been a response to asthma treatment? And is there evidence of reversible airflow obstruction? And also, with the symptoms return after treatment is stopped or after someone misses treatment or stops taking it for a while. So once the diagnosis has been confirmed in somebody who's had an asthma attack, the fourth potential modifiable risk factor is related to dealing effectively with any comorbid conditions that exist in addition to the asthma, which could be implicated um, in the attack that has just happened. Okay, so which comorbid conditions increase the chance of someone having an asthma attack? These include obesity, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, obstructive sleep apnea, food allergy, allergic rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, COPD and pregnancy. Now the problem is that some of these conditions are associated with respiratory symptoms themselves. And that's why it's so important to have documented evidence in the medical record confirming the diagnosis of asthma. So you can tell whether the person's symptoms could be related to asthma or another condition or both. Now three of these conditions, in addition to being associated with and which can aggravate asthma and lead to attacks, also involve inflammatory processes 
that could lead to or worsen asthma. Now these are obesity, gastroesophageal reflux, and obstructive sleep apnea. So starting with obesity, in some people, usually in children, obesity is associated with asthma that is developed due to type 2 inflammation, which is not caused by the obesity. So the two conditions have actually occurred independently and where the obesity has not actually been the cause of the asthma. However, in these children, um, obesity is associated with poor asthma outcomes. So the combination of the two conditions is not good news. In older people with late onset asthma and obesity, the asthma could actually be aggravated by the obesity or by the inflammation which is um, associated with obesity. So clearly, if someone is obese, they must suffer from breathlessness, which may be confused with asthma, which is due to the abdominal compression of the lungs due to the obesity itself. It's also important, as I said, to know that obesity, especially in childhood, together with the asthma, is a high risk for asthma attacks and mortality. In addition, it's more difficult to control asthma in obese people, possibly because of associated inflammation that occurs in obesity. So in these patients, it's really important to help them to lose weight um, because that will help manage their asthma as well. Similarly, in people with gastroesophageal reflux, they may have symptoms of coughing, which may be confused with asthma. So in someone with confirmed asthma who also has reflux, managing the reflux with proton pump inhibitors may help to reduce the asthma symptoms, although research findings are not consistent. So this treatment isn't recommended because it doesn't seem to help many people's asthma. However, one study has suggested that those with both asthma and gastroesophageal reflux disease who also have respiratory symptoms at night may benefit from proton pump inhibitor treatment. So someone who has gastroesophageal reflux disease and uncontrolled asthma may also benefit from a specialist opinion to try and establish the cause of the symptoms and treat the problems. Now the next factor, which also involves an inflammatory process, is obstructive sleep apnea. Now, while there doesn't seem to be a causative link between obstructive sleep apnea and asthma, there is evidence that those with both of these common conditions are at increased risk of poor outcomes from asthma attacks. So it's important to ensure that both conditions are managed as best as possible. In obstructive sleep apnea, in people who also have asthma, there's some evidence that the asthma is better controlled where the obstructive sleep apnea is treated with continuous positive airway pressure, also called CPAP treatment. Okay, so now in the case of food allergy and also anaphylaxis, people who have either of these conditions as well as asthma are at increased risk of poor outcome, particularly asthma death. So anyone with confirmed or suspected diagnosis of food allergy or anaphylaxis should be referred urgently to an allergy specialist, ideally with access to an asthma specialist in the same department. Otherwise, a separate referral may be needed later. Allergic rhinitis can be seasonal or perennial and could contribute to uncontrolled asthma. So anyone with uncontrolled asthma with possible allergic rhinitis should be assessed and, if appropriate, should be prescribed a nasal corticosteroid which is the uh, first-line treatment for allergic rhinitis. Similarly, someone with chronic rhinosinusitis, if they also have nasal polyps, may need treatment with a biologic treatment, which could help the asthma as well as the nasal symptoms. Now, pregnancy is another comorbid condition that's associated with poor asthma control. Now, clearly, you can't fix pregnancy. When somebody's pregnant, they're pregnant. But a key message regarding asthma and pregnancy is that it's really important to ensure that asthma is adequately controlled during pregnancy, both for the benefit of the mother and the child. Because clearly, deprivation of oxygen 
due to a maternal asthma attack could be harmful both for the mother and for the baby. In particular, it's really important that inhaled corticosteroids should not be stopped during pregnancy. Unfortunately, a lot of people believe that they could be harmful during pregnancy, which is incorrect. It's much safer to treat the asthma during pregnancy than to expose the mother to having asthma attacks due to lack of preventive treatment. Now finally, one of the most important comorbid conditions that has possible serious outcome with asthma is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. Now asthma and COPD are both common respiratory conditions and can and do coexist in some people. So what's the problem here? There are two important differences in treatment in these two conditions, where COPD is treated mainly with bronchodilators and asthma requires inhaled corticosteroid. And in those people who have both conditions, asthma and COPD, they should be treated for the asthma. That's really, really important. Now, those with COPD who have raised the eosinophils should also be treated with inhaled corticosteroids. So even if they don't have asthma, somebody who's got chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and raised the eosinophils should be prescribed an inhaled corticosteroid. Now, the other issue is that the diagnosis is sometimes complicated. For example, some people with asthma, who've had asthma for many years, and particularly with severe asthma, have fixed airflow obstruction, and they may be diagnosed incorrectly as having COPD. In fact, one of our findings in the National Review of Asthma Deaths, which was published in 2014, was that 29 of those people who died were being treated with bronchodilators alone because the clinicians thought they were treating COPD and not asthma. So to summarise, anyone who has had an asthma attack should be reviewed with the aim of establishing whether they have comorbid conditions which could aggravate their asthma and which may have been responsible for or contributed to the asthma attack. Now, I've described the comorbid conditions that can aggravate asthma, which may need to be managed to control the asthma. In particular, anyone with food allergy should be referred to a specialist, especially children who've got combined food allergy and asthma. And those who have both asthma and COPD um, should be treated with inhaled corticosteroids according to the latest guidelines.